very much. I'm really honored and uh, very excited to be with you today. Um, my wife is a high school English AP teacher, so very little that you hear today hasn't been run through the gauntlet of her <laughs> scrupulous uh, analysis. Um, and thanks to Eric and the staff for the invitation, and indeed to my colleagues, to uh, Carol and Evan, Elizabeth, for their extraordinary presentations today. Um, I say yes to all of that. Uh, so I affirm everything that they, they have said to you for this talk. And you know, I thought maybe what I could do is, um, in the spirit of maybe uh, talking a little bit about both reading and writing memoir, um, to think a little bit together through, in a sense, the notebooks that shaped my memoir writing. My, what I come to think of, and we've heard a couple of different terms, autobiographical writing, memoir writing, we've heard also life writing, and I would add to that ancestral writing. So um, my practice, in a sense, comes out of an exploration of what it means to practice a certain kind of ancestral writing. And this was not something that was taught to me, but had to be, in a sense, explored, acquired, accumulated over time. So in part, this talk is, is about becoming a writer in San Antonio, Texas, um, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, uh, in a sense, a liminal place. It was where I was born. I was born at the very center of a very intimate and beautiful family. Uh, so that miserable childhood is missing and the royalties that come with a miserable childhood. There was some light chihuahua abuse. <laughs> My grandma had terrible breath. But aside from that, you know, things were incredibly uh, idyllic. And so I had a different kind of story to tell. And I want to share with you, in a sense, really, these are all things that come from notebooks. And I think notebooking, journaling is something that students really should learn as early as possible, as a, as a practice to cultivate their own imagination, to cultivate their observation of the world, the, the kind of prescriptive practice that Elizabeth was laying out out of the Linda Berry um, exercises. So I was born in San Antonio, right, you know, not just in the borderlands, of uh, Texas and Mexico, but in the very middle of the Amer American childhood. So with all that brings with it. In this case, you know, uh, the full trappings of Tejano gear. And, you know, I had to find a way to connect the story that we were living in San Antonio, the emergent modern American city that San Antonio was at that time, with this other story. Another story I knew we possessed through the family tales that I was told. Um, and so education was a very big part of that. This was, a, this was a last report card from Mount Sacred Heart School when the nuns urged me to pursue a career in public education um, <laughs> to terminate my religious and military studies. Um, and, but education was key to finding this story from the very beginning. So reading alongside writing is indispensable. It's something that I teach uh, centrally with my students. So, in my first book, um, Places Left Unfinished at the Time of Creation, it was a story about the Santos and Garcia families, my father's matrilineal and patrilineal families. And it was a story really that was a kind of a gift from the family. There was really no research done for it per se in terms of family stories. These were all stories that had been told to me in kitchens, in backyards, in patios, birthdays, weddings, funerals. Um, and there was a central mystery. The mystery was the death of my grandfather, um, who's here in, uh, holding the pram. My father here is on the, on the left. I told him he was making his debut in a skirt, his national debut in a skirt. Um, my Uncle Raul on the side, my grandmother, and my Aunt Connie in the pram. And you'll see here, it says, places left unfinished at the time of creation, and then at the bottom, a memoir. And I had an argument with my editor, Jane Von Muren, about calling this a memoir. I said, if it's a memoir, it's a memoir without a subject. Because I'm really not much in the book. I, I make glancing appearances, but it's really not autobiographical in that sense. It was an attempt to write the story of the family, but connect it to the epic of Mexico that we came out of, and how the epic of Mexico led to the story of Texas 
the conjunction with the epic of um, the United States. In the second book, a kind of sequel, now it's not any longer a memoir, it's a Tejano elegy. <laughs> the farthest home is in an empire of fire. And this book was about my mother's families, the Lopez and Vela families, that had a very different kind of story. They were much more Spanish, Spanish colonial. They had been knocking around these lands since around 1620 in what is now North Mexico, um, area around Monterrey. And where the family that my father, uh, uh, my father's ancestors gave us was uh, richly told an oral history. My mother's family was virtually not spoken at all. Nothing of it was really told to us. But in her case, everything had been written down. It was in archives and libraries in Mexico City and North Mexico and in Spain. So it was a very different set of journeys that I had to go on to find this story. Um, and then uh, I really began as a poet. Um, Naomi Shahab and I was here a few weeks ago doing a, a course. And Naomi and I met when we were teenagers. And so it was one of the great graces of, of my path as a writer that I had a very, from very early on, uh, a kind of fellow traveler in this exploration, Palestinian, American, American, Mexican, Mexican, becoming Chicano. Um, all of these stories were emerging as we emerged as, as uh, writers, and I was a poet um, in high school as a result of having met Naomi. And in that time, it was just long ago now, you could still look up the addresses of famous writers. And um, in this case, I pursued uh, a poet named Laurel Writing Jackson. Do you know Laurel Writing? She was an extraordinary poet of the early 20th century. And uh, I wrote a letter of appreciation to her, finding her address in rural Florida. And she wrote back a, a lengthy response to my letter of appreciation. It was largely an excoriation. I mean, it was largely um, saying, you know, how dare I pretend to understand her work in the first place? <laughs> and didn't I know that she had repudiated poetry in 1938 and had spent the rest of her life pursuing a higher truth, the use of writing to pursue higher truths? And, and she, um, in a book in the 1970s, so around the time I started writing to her, published this first book called The Telling. And, and there she wrote, I propose that you seek in yourselves remembrance of the before and write what you find and believe your words. And it's a book of um, aphoristic prose poems, although she excoriated me for describing it as that. Um, and, uh, but it was a, a kind of challenge to think about a way of writing that spoke much more deeply, much more incisively into a truth that lay well below the evident world, well below the autobiographical world. Um, so I began to think about our story, our family story, as something that emerged out of deep time, something that was just beginning to come on at that time around the genealogy that is possible through the lens of genetic science, thinking about ourselves in the almost inexhaustible uh, abyss of time, that we could reach farther and farther back. Um, later, I would encounter a geneticist, uh, Robert Pollack, whose book, Signs of Life, is a fantastic book to introduce students to a way of thinking about DNA as a kind of writing, where he says, the notion of DNA as a text makes it possible to imagine natural selection as an author in deep time writing at the rate of perhaps a letter every few centuries to produce the instructions for all living things we are among today. Each of us has always had in each of ourselves a DNA text that guided our development from fertilized egg, embryo, fetus, and person. It is a precise copy of our sole and complete inheritance, one that is far more ancient than any human artifact, humanists, shirt at a text constructed by natural selection and written in an invisible chemical medium. So Laura Writing was challenging me to think about identity 
and self out of the extraordinary abyss of time, the remembrance of the before, at the very same time that we were beginning to model ways of thinking about ourselves in the epic scope of our ancestry. And, and that became a way to think about how we might move forward to account for all of the migrations of our ancestors out of Africa, through Eurasia, into the Americas, the long uh, divorced uh, parts of the family finding their uh, reconnection post-1492 and all the complexity and grief and revelation that that has brought with it. When you do your DNA search these days, you will find that you get a map along with uh, cultural um, signifiers of, of your ancestral origins. And you will soon learn that, in a sense, we're from everywhere. And that we, um, as perhaps as, as claims to being from everywhere, we have an emergent human ethic of a right to be anywhere. And if that's true, then no borders will stand, not just the Texas-Mexico border, but no borders will stand in the long span of time. I, I had that conversation with Governor Perry once and uh, <laughs> got a totally blank stare from him <laughs> the Texas Book Festival. So I knew that my family had this other ancestral journey behind it that had never been taught to me in school. That was a journey that began, in a sense, uh, in terms of the mestizo part of the tale, because we come from indigenous <coughs> and, and European sources. But this map shows the journey of Cortez's army from the coast of Mexico to Tenochtitlan. And uh, the, the encounter that emerged from that journey is the one that ultimately would shape our lives in San Antonio, Texas, that would bring my ancestors to that place. We're about to celebrate the 300th anniversary of San Antonio's founding, and uh, which is extraordinary given the comparison to the American story, the American Republic story, the timeline of, of America. But San Antonio is already emerging well into the tale of New Spain. So we were late arrivals in the epic. So this journey proves to be pivotal in our story and, and was one of the reasons why in Places Left Unfinished, when I was working in the book, I knew I had to make that journey. I had to retrace this, this journey so that story appears in the book. And I had to recover that journey. Mexicans don't commemorate this route. It's not a route they want to be reminded of uh, because of you know, all of the grief that, that the encounter brought. But I was able to recover it and make this journey. I'd been taught about Plymouth Rock. I'd been taught about you know, 1620. But I hadn't been taught about 1520, this other encounter. The encounter in what was the, the greatest city on the planet at the time, <coughs> the largest city on the planet. So when you read Bernal Diaz de Castillo's account of the conquest of Mexico, you see how dumbfounded he is. There's nothing to prepare him for what he sees when they come over the ridge and first glimpse this vast city. Um, and he actually reaches in that, in that description to the stories of Amadis de Gaulle, a French uh, um, uh, writer of uh, fairy tale legends and uh, sort of um, romantic tales. So he has to go to fiction, in a sense, to, to approach the real. So that was another kind of way of thinking about the kind of voice I needed to find to tell that story. A voice that could bridge dream and hallucination, history and anthropology. There would be some archival elements to it, some actual places to see and witness, and all of them would have to be um, situated through language, some way of telling the story. So for me, it meant um, finding a, a way to adjust a sense of what it was to speak the truth that Law Writing Jackson had, in a sense, challenged me to at least strive for. Um, and I found a, a way of approaching it in this, in this inscription. The prophets wrote about the future as if it were the past, and about the past as if it were yet to happen, and similarly with the present. Sometimes they spoke figuratively, other times more realistically, and on occasion, quite literally. One says more or less than another, or expresses it in a better way. And, and this was not a postmodern philosopher. This was not Jacques Derrida. This was Christopher Columbus. Um, Christopher Columbus, 
at a certain point, he's on, up on charges for uh, misappropriating funds, and he's put in jail in Sevilla. And he sets to this task of finding all the references to his life in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's a book called the Book of Prophecies. So he was looking back into the ancient past, into the scriptural past, to find references to his life. You know, this is uh, prefiguring Borges, prefiguring sci-fi, uh, but it also gave me a way to think about, well, there's another aspect of a voice that I need to tell our very unlikely story, our story of the borderlands. Um, so, you know, these are some of the writers who gave me other parts of this voice. Um, Sir Thomas Brown, uh, this fantastic physician, writer of the 17th century, 1626, he writes this essay called Hydriotapia, or Urn Burial. Uh, an extraordinary essay that I use no matter what I'm teaching. It doesn't really matter what I'm teaching. Right now I'm teaching a science essay, a talk memoir, some filmmaking courses, and an intermittent course I teach at UTSA on the hermeneutics of mestizaje, sort of interpreting mestizo identities. I always begin with Sir Thomas Brown's Hydriotapia. And if you can imagine Hamlet having done psychotherapy and kind of getting his act together, being able to truly philosophize with intent about uh, his point of view, you get a sense of what Sir Thomas Brown does in Hydriotapia. So I commend Hydriotapia or urn burial. It, it's occasioned by the discovery of urn of bones in central England, which launches uh, Brown into this extraordinary sprawling exploration of means of burial in human history and reflections on mortality and immortality. Uh, Thomas Traherne, another late 17th century writer who uh, writes Centuries of Meditation, a kind of philosophical uh, brief on uh, experiences of the divine, the great poet Christopher Smart, William Blake, William Wordsworth, Walt Whitman, Texan writer William Goyen, Camilo Jose Sela, a great Spanish writer, who committed to writing every book in a different voice, in a different style. He wanted each book to be, in a sense, its own statement, its own testimonio, and then a great, of course, Borges and Fuente. All of these writers, except for Goyen and Fuentes, were introduced to me by teachers, by my high school teachers <coughs> and by my university teachers. You know? So the awakening to the, the complexity of voice was something that really was brought to me by my teachers. And uh, both in terms of just inviting me to understand the complexity of these voices, but also how to interpret them, how to read these texts. Um, and you know, this meant that out of all of these voices, I began to think about doing what I was calling anadogic journalism. I was a journalist for some time uh, before I started writing the, the, the ancestral writing works. But anagogic journalism kind of refers to the fourfold medieval interpretation of, of scriptures. You know, there's the literal, uh, there is the allegorical, how the text can be interpreted uh, in terms of its meaning uh, in the life of Christ, and then the moral level of interpretation, which is how you should live as a result of the scriptural um, uh, uh, text. And then the final one was anagogy, the point of view that Christopher Columbus was talking about, kind of trying to achieve a place outside of time in your approach to how you report on things. You report on things of today as if they happened 500 years ago. And you report on things 500 years ago as if they happened yesterday. Uh, so anagogic journalism was a keystone of this voice, and another uh, an emergent way of thinking about a writing practice was this um, virtually unpronounceable neologism, inadvertentism, a kind of philosophical commitment to inadvertentism and inadvertency as part of a writing practice. So I wanted to, in a sense, dispute the imperial self in this writing. I wanted to dispute the idea that I could control a narrative about my life. And, you know, so it was uh, incumbent on me as a writer to think about how to bring the unintended into the process. Um, you know, how to bring that which is unplanned. Uh, rather than Hemingway going to Pamplona to run the bulls, 
maybe being on a ranch where you really had to get out of bull's way. You know, that's sort of a, a crude analogy, but you know, putting yourself into a, a, a scenario where things transpire, where things about the world are revealed. So these were all practices that kind of led to the emergence of a story, a storyline for both of the books about my parents' families that really turned on some key motifs that emerged. Antiquity and origins, I talked about the idea of a self in deep time, the diaspora and migrations that set ancestors in motion, encountering others, mixing with them, and being transformed. And I found that this was, in a sense, kind of the mythic core of our story, our borderland story, our fronterizo family that had this dual rooting in the epic of Mexico and the epic of the United States. And to tell this, I had to do it with a different set of references, a different, um, I could use all these old 17th century writers' tonalities as a writer, but I would have to go to different kinds of places and make different kinds of references and develop a language that was uh, fractured with English and Spanish together. Um, and that became an increasingly complex question. The initial idea was, well, perhaps um, I could put all the Spanish in italics. But then you would open a page in printed, uh, in printed form, and you'd see you know, this weird mosaic of italic words all over the place. And, and in the first book, there was this um, conversation with that same editor, Dan Von Mirren, and we talked about, well, let's all of those words that have recognizable cognates uh, in Spanish, let's bring those into Roman font. You know, almost like they were metabolized into Roman font. And then we began to see that, well, that would really be sass in, in a sense of Spanish that was look at, looking a little more alien and hence could, could be uh, more properly done in, in Italic. Um, so antiquity and origins meant places of beginning. And for us, you know, in terms of the indigenous epic, there was this idea, the journey out of Aslan, you may have heard this, the place from which the Aztecs believed they came. This is another version of it called Chico Mostoc. But everybody that came out of central Mexico had a version of this story. We came out of a place with seven lakes. We went on a long journey, this Exodus-like tale. And it was paralleled in a sense, or followed by the Spanish exploration, a host of Spanish explorations. All of these represented in this map are completed by the year 1540. So again, a deeper antiquity than I was taught in my schools um, coming up in Texas public education. Um, or for that matter, the encounter between civilizations that was recorded in very early post-conquest codices. Um, but this is a really amazing one from a codex um, that is, is drawn in the late 1560s. Um, but it shows the conflagration of the old gods Franciscan setting light to the old gods. But what's interesting in this image is that these, these images of the old gods here um, are very specific references to uh, gods in unique um, perspectives. The Tlaloc, the rain god, or the feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl, but represented as a Hecatl, the wind god. So he had these different incarnations. Um, only a mestizo mind could have painted them. On this. And it's done in kind of European perspectival uh, form. And um, it began to suggest to me that from the very earliest story, it, uh, origins of the story of, of the Mestizaje, that there were these minds from two worlds beginning to emerge. They, they were already cross coding and, um, and using uh, palimpsests of language. Um, this is a map, in a sense, that much more directly related out of the Spanish epic to our presence in Texas. This is um, a map from the 1740s, but redrawn in the 1790s, um, that the Rio Grande is right here, um, that records the expeditions of José de Escandón, the last conquistador of Mexico. The last conquistador, because he's the one that got brought up on charges. You know, I mean, he outlived the... Um, the uh, forgiveness of the, the conquistadores and was brought up on charges, dies um, on, on, uh, in prosecution. But this uh, map shows the founding of Laredo and many of the, the towns of the borderlands um, in Tamaulipas. 
And many of the, the families in San Antonio that I grew up with came out of these expeditions, including my mother's family. This is Escandon in his death portrait here uh, from the 1770s. So San Antonio had this rooting in this epic. These are petroglyphs uh, from caves around San Antonio, this place that I grew up with in an American city watching The Rifleman and John Wayne and visiting the Alamo and field trips had this story that had never been told, this rooting in the epic that um, had shaped all of our families in ways that we had forgotten. Uh, the, the paradigmatic um, Tastas paintings that represented what you get when you cross what with what, is the best way to put it, uh, the permutations of human mixture. There are about 95 different ones. This is the paradigmatic one, Indio con mestizo produce uh, Indio con Español produce mestizo, the nuclear families, about 95 different ones. And it was really uh, created as a way to uh, taxonomize um, oppression, to, ta to kind of classify uh, racial science. And, um, but uh, it, it was, and it was a, a system that pervaded the Americas, um, Afro-Mexicano, Afro-Peruano, Mexican indigenous, Peruano indigenous, Mexican Spanish, until artists began to reflect on it. And Edmenegildo Bustos became a, another key figure for me in this story, um, a self-taught painter from Oaxaca in the 1880s, uh, here in a self-portrait. Um, and he had begun his career as a painter, painting commemorations of healings and various other uh, miracles, so he would be commissioned to tell the story for a family, and then they would post these, these santos, as they were called, in churches. But he begins to paint Mexicans with compassion. And he uses the very same formula as the Castas paintings. He begins to use the nuclear family, but painting them outside of a system of racial classification, almost to say this is who we are, the skin hues, the, 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 the mien's, the, extraordinary sense of, of compassion that's so evident in these pieces. Um, and this story, you know, was then the one that brought us back to um, Texas. How do we think about this legacy coming to Texas? Um, my grandmother was a teacher, uh, so such as my, my wife, uh, who's been influential in shaping the, the sort of homage to the teacher's role in all of this. My grandmother, her sister, Fermina, they taught in a school in Catula, 1909. So the legacy of connecting the, the story that came out of Mexico came in part from my grandmother urging it on me. And, and, uh, and my father uh, came out of a very different uh, story, family coming out of Coahuila, um, connecting us to this story of our origins out of this epic of the 18th century that had brought um, the epic of Mexico to San Antonio, this being one of the first plans of San Antonio that I found in the archive in Sevilla. I'd never seen it anywhere in San Antonio. Uh, one of the very first drawings or plot map of San Antonio. So I'd grown up thinking that, well, I went to, went to the missions that uh, they'd always been this way. They'd always been protected and they'd always been vouchsafed for time. But this is what San Jose mission in San Antonio, I don't know if y'all have been there, uh, just became a World Heritage Site, one of the missions that are now World Heritage Site. This is what it looked like at the turn of the 20th century. It was meant to fall to ruins. So all of us who played a role in whatever small way in recovering the story were working against this tide that saw the old San Antonio, this city born 300 years ago, in the epic of another mythic time, um, beginning to confront and engage with the emergence of an American city. This being, for me, a kind of a, you know, uh, uh, earlier Carol talked about Lulan and Maxine von Kingston's great story. The Charo on a tightrope has got become, for me, the sort of the figure that symbolizes this tension. Putting the Charo on a tightrope, sort of the Felipe Petit of the borderlands. Um, but this was the old San Antonio that, you know, was um, already in somewhat of an eclipse by the time I was born. Um, I was reminded of it most directly by my uncle Lico, who you'll see in, in both books in various ways. He was the family genealogist. In the back of this card, he puts two JP, con cariño. So here he's already kind of prefiguring the emphasis on genetics, good genes. Um, this is from 1987. But this is one of uncle Lico's 
very fanciful family trees uh, of the Vela family. And um, in this one you can see down here, uh, my grandmother, no, down this way, but at the top is the King of Spain. Um, <laughs> no, no specific uh, reference, but King of Spain. Uh, so he had this reminder to us that we came out of very grand origins. It was something we found deeply set in Mexican imagination. This is a genealogy from the 16th century, late in the 16th century. But these families coming together in San Antonio out of this epic with a story we'd largely forgotten. That was the challenge, how to tell it. My, my mother and her family, my mother is there on the left, my grandmother, and my uncles and aunts. Um, and our Santos Garcia family here were pouring out of a house that is now under the Alamo Dome in San Antonio. Uh, I'm here in the, the front, the only photograph I was ever captured wearing a bow tie in. Um, <laughs> and you know, so a very, a very um, ordinary story. When I was telling people I was writing about my family, they said, well, what's so important about your family? You know, you're not a Kennedy, you're not Bush. Um, but it's in fact, the fact that we come out of the origins of everyone, that we were part of this very common story that was what I was going after, with its connection to this much more cosmic sense of origin. Uh, the kind of cosmic time that the Mayans were interested in. The idea that you could map the, the turn of the days, the, the day count of the calendar, to the cosmic cycles. You know, something different from astrology, but the Mayans were particularly obsessed with it, such that they even mapped the past into octillions of years into the past, well beyond the origin of the universe. Um, so that story was part of how I could get at telling this epic tale. In the first book, it really turned on a specific ritual, the volador ritual. If you, any of you have ever seen it in Mexico City, it's a ritual where four dancers, climb, five really, climb up the uh, top of this pole and they, uh, they disentwine uh, the, the gathered um, rope by swinging in these large arcing circles while one caporal dances on the top of the, um, of the pole. It was a ritual that encapsulated the descent to earth of the ancestors. It captured the sense of the passage of time. It was a, a, a ritual performance of memory in a way that I'd never experienced it. And I was reminded that I'd seen it when I was a kid at Hemisphere in San Antonio, 1968. The Voladores first came to San Antonio. I first witnessed that ritual, made that connection, and began to tell the story in a way connecting to the numinous aspect of landscape. You know, how a landscape can connect us to stories, journeying through the landscape, retracing earlier journeys. And throughout all this time, lots of conversations with artists, writers, a long conversation with Sandra Cisneros over many, many years about these themes and how we regather these stories out of our, our lost origins in this epic, um, this being a work of Angel Rodriguez Diaz, um, uh, Puerto Rican born, but longtime San Antonio based artist, calls himself now a Border Rican. Um, <laughs> and another early influence, Carlos Castaneda, um, the the anthropologist um, shaman um, who wrote what I still consider to be this um, uh, central epic of the mestizo story. It's, it's the story for whatever you think about it in terms of fact or fiction or some combination of both. It's a story that, that tells of a drama in which the mestizo mind opts for the indigenous worldview. It, it performs a drama that begins to turn the cycle of, of exclusion and repression and uh, neglect on its head. Um, so I always saw him as very important in terms of the Chicano narrative. Um, and this is a really interesting picture on the occasion of the, the huge success of the teachings of Lavoie, the very first book in the cycle. They wanted him to be on the cover of Psychology Today. And he said, well, he would only be part of this shamanic initiation involved um, not being photographed. And you won't find photographs of Carlos Castaneda on the web or anywhere else. Um, the New York Times 
uh, when they published recently a, a piece on him, they published a picture of Carlos Castaneda, the Texas historian, the 1930s <laughs> Texas historian, um, one of the great New York Times errors of all time. Um, <laughs> but here, he only agreed to be uh, represented in pencil drawing on the condition that he be allowed to erase it. So it's, it's drawn, it says here, drawn by Dick Odom, erased by Carlos Castaneda. So erasure, <laughs> erasure as an inscriptive process, that erasing becomes part of the way that we begin to, to tell our story. Another piece here of Ankel, um, where he's arranged uh, on, this, um, on this tabletop implements of his own journey out of Puerto Rico through New York City, finally to San Antonio, you see his gaze there in the mirror. Um, it's, a, it's a way of um, staging, in a sense, some of the complexities and narrative that I think a lot of us from the borderlands um, are occasion, including the figurine, where she says, was ever mind uh, the viewer that somebody's always getting screwed in these stories. Um, <laughs> so um, I just want to end by, by kind of returning to this idea that the ancestral um, writing practice is one that involves um, an attempt to deepen the source of self-reflection and to complicate it, sometimes to complicate it to the point of opacity. Um, you know, in the second book, um, Farther Stones in an Empire of Fire, um, the book is co-narrated. So I tell the story along with a character named Cenote Siete, who's a sort of time-traveling ancestor from the future. Um, it's not fiction, it's, it's a narrative voice I live. I mean, in the book has an account of how he comes into my life and how he leaves me. Um, that opacity may or may not account for poor book sales in that volume. Uh, <laughs> I'm presenting something memoiristic, but it has the time traveling ancestor from the future. Um, you begin to test the reader's patience or um, willingness to engage in your journey. But, you know, for me the challenge remains how to testify to the truth of this life lived out of the borderlands for a long time living in New York City and where that goes next. <coughs> um, this last book, uh, Inadvertency, continues in many different ways. The last book, um, the publication date was the same date as the birth of our daughter five years ago. I mean, literally the same day. And then I was pregnant a lot longer than my wife was. Uh, but there's a third book in that. The idea is still that there's a third book in this series. It's more, my, maybe more verging towards autobiographical. Um, where the first two books, um, they're really staged uh, narratives of these ancestral journeys. Uh, the third book, uh, Whenever this comes with um, baking bread and taking um, hikes to Enchanted Rock and Natural Bridge Caverns, when that period uh, begins to recede a bit, we get back to it. But it remains the, the challenge. How do you find a way to speak to the truth, the complexity of your story? Um, simple that down. Thank you.